Recording in progress. Kia ora everyone. Tēnā tātā kato. Ko Yanisha ve tōku ingoa. Ko Papa Mo tōku whenua kura. Ko Māua te monga. Ko Toronga de Moana. No Oto Tahiaho. Kia ora and welcome to this sorted webinar. My name is Yanisha and I'm your kai whakahaere, your facilitator for today. I love seeing a few people are in Christchurch, Tauranga, Papamoa, um, connections to the places where I've been, where I've lived and where I am today. So thank you for joining us today. It's a real privilege to have you here. And for Sorted Money Month as well, which is awesome. Throughout the whole month of August, we're encouraging you to hit pause, take a moment and get your money sorted. And that is what you're doing here today as we do our second webinar in this Tuesday lunchtime series. So I hope you do have your lunch with you. I have my cup of water, so I'm all ready to go as well. And I'll have lunch later on, perhaps with my husband, if he um, is able to join me. So that'll be great. Enjoy this hour that we have together. Just a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded. So um, this is so that we can provide a copy of the webinar to those who registered, because you've all registered and not everyone will be able to make it to the live recording. So you can watch it again later and they will also receive a copy. Sorted will not be using this webinar recording for any other purposes. And if you don't wish to be recorded, please be assured that your videos are off. But if you feel uncomfortable in any way, please leave the call and come back and watch the recording at a later time. So who is Sorted? Sorted provides free, independent and impartial information around all things Money Matters. Sorted is run by Te Ara Ahunga Ora, the Retirement Commission, and their aim is to empower the people of Aotearoa on their journeys to a better retirement by helping them understand money. What I love about their resources is that you can look at them from a point of view of a five-year-old and, and learn about sorting your money from a really young age all the way up to 105. So the resources that they have available on their website suit so, so many different life stages that we go through and any life events as well that we might experience. You can probably find a blog on Sorted about that as well. During these webinars and any seminars that we um, offer through Sorted, we can't give any specific financial advice. But what we will do is give you some great resources that you can use to make more informed financial decisions. Don't let that stop you asking questions. I love your questions and I look forward to the questions that you have in the chat. I just can't give you any specific financial advice and that's really important to me. My background is I'm a chartered accountant. I'm actually an ex-auditor. If you know any auditors in the room, then you'll know that we're just a little bit nosy and we like to know about systems and controls and processes and the like. So I use that to now become an associate financial advisor. That's where I'm working at the moment. And I'm also an ex-financial mentor. I've worked in that space for about a decade. And I've been a sorted facilitator doing this sort of work, but live face-to-face -face, for nearly a decade as well. So it's fair to say I wear a few different hats. And today I'm sitting very firmly in the mentoring and financial uh, facilitator space of general advice only. So I've worked in a variety of different areas, which means that you can pick my brains from all sorts of angles if you like. So please do use that um, in the chat. Before we go any further though, I would like to say a short karakia. This is the Commission's karakia. If you were at last week's webinar, you'll be familiar with it as well. So you can follow along on the screen and just um, join in if you like. Tuia e runga, tuia e raro, tuia e roto, tuia e wahu. Tuia ki te ara a hua ora, ki a whaihua, ki a ora. Homie, huie, tai ki e. So ki ora guys. So today what are we looking at? We are looking at the subject of debt. What it really costs and how to get on top of it. So that is our main function for today. Um, hopefully you'll be able to leave with a few different debt strategies that maybe you haven't heard of before. Or if you have heard of them, there may be some different ways that you can utilize them as well. We'll look at what's involved with meeting our commitments and also what the uh, commitments are from the point of view of a lender as well. We will look at some numbers. So we will look at the true cost of debt and I'll introduce you to the different calculators that we can use on the sorted website as well. And finally, I'd like for you to be able to set some goals for yourself and terms of debt and what it is that you're trying to achieve as well. So hopefully you're all well and truly familiar with Zoom and its functions. There are plenty of different functions on there. Please use them all. I can see a few people already using the emoticons and everything, the reaction buttons. Please use that. It's really encouraging to see your reactions to the things that we do. Because I can't see you face to face, um, that's a really important way that we can react um, 
on this inline process. That's really good. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. Natalie will be joining me as well on this line. Natalie is from the Retirement Commission and she'll be keeping an eye on the chat as we go along. So if I miss anything, um, hopefully Natalie will be there just to pick it up and make sure I answer any questions that we need to. So I do have a second screen open and I do have your chat just going live and scrolling on my screen beside me, which is great. So don't forget to take notes as we go and please do ask questions. I'm going to lower any hands that were raised during that as well. Thanks for using that function. So let's start off by having a think about what is our attitude towards debt. I'm going to launch this poll. And you should be able to see that poll on your screen now. What is your current today? How do you feel attitude to debt? Do you find that you are ignoring it? It's overwhelming, stressful, you tend to avoid it altogether. Or does it help you to increase your opportunities? How are you feeling today? I say today because sometimes our attitude around debt does change. Let's see, see so lots of people hopping in there and answering. Loving seeing that number jump up and down. I find it quite fun because I get to see the different, the poll answers move at the same time as well. I think we're slowing down now. Last chances to pop in your, your thoughts. And we're up to about 110 people, so let's let's end that poll and I'll show share with you what the results are here. Thanks for jumping on there so quickly as well. It's quite exciting to see the numbers um, jump up like that. We've got around about uh, nearly 130 people on the line with us at the moment today. So well done. It's awesome. So as you can see from this poll, very simple poll, very quick poll, of what, um, what our, our attitudes might be around debt. We have a real range of attitudes and fears and worries, but also considering what the opportunities that we have. So some people do consider debt to be an opportunity and that is not wrong. Also, it can be stressful. Our attitudes can change over time as well, especially when we're influenced by the economic environment that we're in, the political environment, um, but also our own learnings, the way we educate ourselves, the way we've come to understand debt will change our attitude towards debt as well. I understand a few people are having difficulties with the recording. Um, I was having difficulties this morning as well when I tried to log in. Hopefully things will pan out okay. If it gets really annoying, hop off, maybe try joining us back in again and maybe it'll be a better connection. Hopefully the recording itself will be fine and you can watch that back later on. I'm going to stop sharing this poll. But yeah, it's a bit of a pain, isn't it? It's one of those things when it comes to uh, webinars. It could be my end, it could be your end, it could be around the country, who knows for sure. I can see a few people have also popped into the chat and just shared a few other thoughts and feelings that come to mind when thinking about debt. So feel free to hop into the chat and share as well. See uh, some people who are trying to buy their first home and that is stressful. Because not only are you dealing with the debt side of things, you're also dealing with the idea of buying um, a house as well. Oh, did my screen disappear? Can I get a thumbs up if you can see my shared screen? Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was a bit concerning to see that disappear. <laughs> very cool. Thank you. So buying your first home can be stressful and then you've got the debt side of it as well. So understanding how that works. We actually do a whole other webinar on preparing for your first home, so pathways to buying your first home. So, and so just so you know, that's about two hours that webinar. So we're not going to cover all of that today. But if you have any specific questions, hop into the chat and we'll see what we can do. Um, some people have avoided debt their whole life. Um, they also bought a house and that was stressful as well. I too grew up avoiding debt. I was taught that cash is king. So I didn't have an awful lot of understanding around debt, to be honest. I didn't understand compound interest. I didn't understand the different fees that were involved. I learned that as I grew to become an adult. So that's um, that can affect our own personal attitudes toward debt as well. Perhaps mine was... Uh, it was overwhelming and I avoided it completely because I didn't see its purpose. Um, other people have paid off their debts except for their mortgage, so a car buy, that's awesome. Very good. 
the first home, buying the first home resources are all available on the sort of website, not the um, the, the webinar though. That's uh, a, something you can actually get through a workplace environment. If you feel in, interested in that, then have a chat with us at the end of the webinar and we can see what can we can do. So our attitudes can change over time when it comes to debt and it is influenced by what we know and who we know and what's going on around us. So what are some of the things that we need to consider before we take on debt? What are some of the things that we might be might be running through our mind before we decide to sign on for a loan of some sort, whether it's a big loan or a small loan? Hop into the chat and just give me some ideas and things that we might be thinking about. Affordability, whether or not it's a good debt. Uh, what else might we, we be looking at? The rate, so the interest rate, the finance rate, any interest charges, absolutely. Any default interest as well, that can be a real key. Whether or not we want it or we need it. Oh yes, that's for sure. What will happen if I can't pay? That's a really, really good question. How do we manage the repayments? Can I manage the repayments today? And what happens if things change over, over time? Will I still be able to manage those repayments? What terms and conditions are involved with the loan? Is there anything hidden in those T's and C's that I'm not aware about? What income we might have? Will, our, will my income change? Will that affect our loan as well? Any security on the debt? So is there anything that's tagged to that debt that if I don't pay it, that item might get taken away as well. Our credit rating as well, that's another thing to consider when taking on debt. If we're locked in for any period of time. Yeah, some really, really good questions or thoughts coming through in here. How secure is our job? There are a lot of things that we need to consider from the financial side of things, you know, the fees, the interest, the fine print, um, and uh, repayment terms, early repayment rules. Can I repay thing? Can I repay this loan early? And will I be penalized for it as well? Will I get charged for communication or letters that are sent out to us? But there's also the emotional load as well, and just the thought that goes into carrying a debt. If you've got debt, do you pay off the debt or do you buy food? So there's a lot of thought that might go along with whether or not we consider to take on debt. If I take on this debt, is it going to impact our, our living, the way we, our lifestyle? What are the risks of any life events that might come up or uh, that might affect our affordability or our ability to pay this loan? And also, what are our current commitments? Is there anything that we're currently paying? So there are a lot of things that we consider. And it's important to calculate not just the cost of debt in a monetary sense, but that emotional impact as well, because that will have an effect on other areas of your life. So those extra fees, you've got the finance cost as well. You've got the um, personal property and securities register fee, the PPSR. That one quite often sneaks into a loan contract and people don't necessarily see it documentation fees, and always be careful about insurance on certain contracts. Just double check it's not already included in, say, your contents insurance, so you may not need to be paying for it twice. I always remember being quite astounded by establishment fee costs because they can get quite high. So just be aware of what those extra costs are. They can definitely add up. Somebody in the chat was asking about good debt. Now, I've lost where that question went to. But they were asking about good debt. Another way of thinking about debt is whether it is productive or unproductive. When we say productive or unproductive or good or better or bad debt, what are some of the things that you think about? What is the difference between bad debt or better debt or productive debt or unproductive debt? What are some of your thoughts there? What's the difference between the two, do you think? I'm reluctant to use the word good debt because debt still has a cost involved. And so is it good or is it better, perhaps? So things like uh, buying a business might be better debt, might be productive because it's increasing your opportunity for earning. Student loans is another example of a productive debt because that's something that's increasing your ability to, um, your earning potential basically, your career opportunities that are there. So a study loan builds your skills and your knowledge. Um, productive debt, um, using the interest uh, free period could be productive, can be wise. I don't know if it's productive. 
it depends on what the actual item is as to whether I would think it's perhaps productive or unproductive, but it's definitely wise to use the interest-free period and make sure that you do pay it off within that timeline. Buying a house could be productive debt. It could very well be because paying off a mortgage can help us to build a more secure future. And so therefore it's a little bit more productive. Other debt doesn't necessarily set us up for the future. And I think that's the real difference between productive and unproductive. If it sets you up for your future, it's productive. If it doesn't set you up for your future, then it's unproductive. So buying, um, using credit for a car, an excessive car loan, for example, as opposed to a car that you need to drive around, um, or possessions, that can be unproductive debt. Buying food or a holiday on your credit card can be unproductive because in the way that it's once it's gone, it's gone. You can't reproduce it to pay off that debt. Paying off your credit card is obviously the key there. So entertainment, things that are gone once you've purchased it, is an example of unproductive debt there. Obviously, we we need to we might need debt in order to enable us to get to places like work, which is why a car is one of those ones that sits in that gray area of being productive versus unproductive. It depends on the level of debt. If it's um, something that's going to help you get to your job, it's not going to put you out of buying, um, buying covering your living costs, then perhaps it's considered more productive debt because it's helping you to improve and build your skills and your knowledge so that you can build a more secure future. Very good. Looking at the different comments that are going on into the chat, I had to check if my husband was here because I saw somebody comment on camera equipment. Yeah, exactly. That's part of your business. So there you go. Very good. And just checking anything else in the chat there. Good debt is manageable and helps you get to places where your income or well-being improves. I like the sound of that, Suzanne. Very good. And credit card can be good if you can repay that balance every month. If you can pay your credit card off in full, then I believe you're winning in terms of your credit card side of things. If you can't pay it off in full, then it's one of those things to consider, is that the right limit for you? Because you don't want to be charged extra interest unnecessarily for things, especially if you do use your credit card for um, purchasing your groceries or your petrol, for example. So being clever around that side of things. Okay, so hopefully the internet connection is going to be okay for us here. And we're going to listen to a, a short money story from Francois from Petoni. Hi, I'm Francoise and um, my husband and I live in Petoni and I guess we've always had debt. It started like 16,000, gradually got bigger and bigger. It sort of grew like mold and then we're like, blah, <laughs> yeah. At $40,000 we had three credit cards, a store card and a finance company loan. I just sort of thought, well, enough's enough. So the first step was to sort of sit down, go through all of our debts and work out like a bit of a weekly budget. Once we'd done that, we looked at saving up a safety net. So when things come along as they always do, we wouldn't have to turn to the credit card. And um, oh, I've also got these envelopes. This is just a small selection. I have about nine of them. But um, so this is my clothing fund. This is a special events fund, so Christmas and birthdays and Easter. And it's an entertainment fund. It's really good because it um, having to hand over cash, you sort of think more about what you're doing. We could pay it off faster if we just went completely bare bones, but we sort of want to live too. There's some things you have to do that just make life worth living. We want to um, start saving up a bigger safety net, so probably like three months worth of our salary so that we've sort of got security there. And then after that, to so look at making a big dent in our mortgage and just getting rid of that. So it's a long way to go, but um, it's good to kind of feel like we're in control. Yeah, you know, it's quite the money story really, isn't it? When you think about how things can really add up over time. I don't want to play it, I don't want, don't want to play it again there. Uh, you can see some of the strategies that Francoise is already implementing just to try and pay off her debt. She's obviously made a spending plan, which is what we talked about last week in our, um, in our webinar, just creating that spending plan so that you know where your money is going and you can decide where your money is going as well. 
And maybe part of that is paying off debt. So having the right debt strategies can play into your spending plan and make that work there. I love the envelope st um, stuffing. That's the new way of um, the envelope system. People call it envelope stuffing. I think that also came up last week as well as a money, a money a system that you can use to help you feel in control of your spending plan, but also everything else as well. She's saving up with a emergency fund. Also another key part of having one of these, um, having your spending plan work or your money strategy work for you as well. Yeah. You wouldn't want to have too much in those envelopes, I agree, in case you might lose an envelope or perhaps some, um, yeah, it might get stolen. You've got to be careful about that. So maybe just having one or two weeks worth of money in there might be the way to go. But talk to um, a, maybe a financial mentor around that or just, just have some thinking around your family and how you guys feel comfortable is about that as well. So some really great tips in there. And it's about that feeling of control, which of you being in control of your of your situation, that's really key. The thing is, it's really easy to get into debt. As soon as you turn 18, the banks will offer, start offering you credit cards and finance options as well. But once you get into it, it's really hard to get out of it. Those uh, monthly payments might sound like a really small price to pay, but when we consider the additional costs, that interest over time, the sacrifice to our future earnings, that debt just sits there hanging over our heads for longer than may be necessary. Sometimes debt is important, but make sure if you're taking on debt, it's for the right reasons and that you have a realistic plan to pay it down as soon as you can. I've worked with clients who have accumulated thousands of thousands of dollars of debt over many, many years. By the time they would come to see a financial mentor, they were they were sinking and it was really, really difficult. And they wanted a quick fix. In fact, I wanted to be able to give them a quick fix. That's why I was working there. That's what I wanted to do. But the reality is, it can take years to get into debt and it's going to take years to get out of it as well. So the idea is to come up with some good strategies so that we can buy us back some time. So hopefully it doesn't take as many years as um, to get out of it as we would like. You know, just, yeah, help us out. So here's a real that credit card comment there as well. So almost two thirds of New Zealanders with credit cards pay them off in full each month. I would love to see that increase that number. So get it amongst the statistics there of people paying off their credit card. It's more common than you think. Yeah, I still remember turning 18 and being offered a credit card and I had no idea what that was for or how I would use it. So I don't think I said yes. I was quite happy with my savings account um, at that stage. And that's because we hadn't used credit growing up. I didn't feel comfortable with it. But that's because I didn't understand it as well. <coughs> So I can see some people commenting in the chat about how their children have been offered credit cards um, as soon as they turn 18 or 20. That's kind of shocking, really, isn't it? And still paying it off. That's the problem. So what are some of the strategies that you've heard of or perhaps are using to pay off debt fast, as quick as you can? What are some of the ideas that you've, um, you've already used? Hop into the chat and just let us know some of these strategies. I'm keen to hear what your thoughts are. Straight on in there, Jade, with the snowball method. Awesome. We'll be talking about the snowball method very, very soon. It's probably one of my favorite things. Consolidation is um, a strategy people have heard of. Increasing the minimum payment. Pay off ones with the highest interest first. That one's called the avalanche uh, method. And I will also show you through and take you through that one as well. Adding extra dollars, any extra dollars, any extra little amounts will add up and will help you save on interest as well. Yeah, there's the old short-term pain for long-term gain strategy. So we're just going to knuckle down now and get things sorted so that we can clear it off and we will reap the benefits later on. Other people are more inclined to do the maths and try and work out which mathematical way is the best way to pay off their debt. Combining debts into a lower um, interest loan, that's your debt consolidation. And that one really depends on your motivation. So the cost now versus the cost over time. When we consolidate our debts, we're quite often taking different debts of different sizes, of different time frames as well, and different interest rates. So when we consider all those different variables, it's important to work out whether it's going to be beneficial for you to consolidate your debt. If the most important thing is to reduce your uh, weekly payment, then con debt consolidation can do that because it will take the, those say five different loans, consolidate them into one and stretch them out over say five years. 
And that, so that might be one way of reducing that weekly payment. However, if those five different debts had different time frames that they were going to finish on, say one year, three years, and five years, now that one year debt is going to be spread out over five years. So you'll be paying interest on it for longer. And so therefore the cost can be more over time with debt consolidation. So it's important to look at what's your motivation. If it's that weekly payment, so you can afford your day-to-day -day living, then debt consolidation can do that trick. But if you're looking at reducing the cost over time, then debt consolidation can sometimes make you go backwards a little bit. So just talk to the people and do the maths around that one as well. So other um, different strategies people have used, um, take advantage of the 55 days debt free and then pay off the full amount and definitely double check that 55 as well. Make sure it's not 56, for example, and then um, interest can be put onto the remaining amount, which was a change. So it used to go back onto the full amount. So I'm glad that one changed there as well. See a few strategies around jumping credit cards. If you've got the time to do that, sure. I have a friend who used to do that as well, just jump the payments between the credit cards. That looked like way too much hard work for me. Um, if you can keep on top of it, the last thing I'd want to do is to lose track of what, where I was going and what I was doing next. I like to keep things as simple as possible. Good old sticker chart has worked for um, some people in the past or using your calendar can be a really a good way of using it as well. Somebody else just mentioned some credit cards, it's 44 days and not 55. So being aware of what that time frame is for your particular loan that you're working on there. There are lots of different strategies that we can use. There are also mentioned uh, community loans. So there are interest-free or no interest or low interest community loans out there uh, through the Good Shepherd is one of the ones that you can look at. If you know of any other ones, Citizens Advice Bureau is amazing for helping people out with that as well as um, Money Talks, who I will give you the phone number for that one at the end of today's webinar as well. So there are some no interest and low interest loans out there if you really need help. Also, if you're on a low income, then working income can help you out. You don't have to be a beneficiary to access some of those different um, grants that are available. You just need to have a low income. So you might be surprised at what's available there for you. Other strategies might be taking on extra gig work or a side hustle, so trying to increase your income so that you can pay things off quicker and make that lump sum payment. That can be really handy. We're also heading into spring, believe it or not. The lambs are, are starting to arrive. So a spring clean or a garage sale can be helpful too, just to clear some of that extra debt that you might have that you want to clear off. So a couple of the key strategies that were mentioned, and the first one that was mentioned was the debt snowball. And that is an amazing, I love the debt snowball method. It brings me so much joy. I consider it a little bit like magic. Picture a snowball rolling down a hill and it's gathering a momentum as it gets bigger and bigger. This is what happens with your payments, with your repayments with the debt snowball. You start off with the smallest payment, the smallest loan, and it, you pay that one off and you move on. But I'm going to let Paul explain a little bit further. And again, I get a little bit of joy out of this one because I remember explaining it to him many, many years ago. So here we go. Here's Paul explaining the debt snowball method. With a debt snowball, you knock out the smallest debt first, move on to the next smallest, and keep going until you've got the momentum of a snowball rolling downhill eventually taking them all out. There are two advantages to this. You get the boost of seeing one of your debts disappear sooner, and that sense of progress propels you towards eliminating the next one, and so forth. Much about money depends on how we think about it. And getting on a roll with a debt snowball can really work for some people. And since some of the small debts may be to family or friends, Paying those back early can benefit those relationships too. Has anyone used the debt snowball um, as, a, as a way of tackling debt in the past? Give me some reactions if you've used it before. A few people have, which is very good. What are your thoughts about the debt snowball? Did it work for you? Or would you be interested in, in utilizing something like that? Pop into the chat if you like. I can share your thoughts there. I see Lisa has shared the link to uh, Nathanga Micro um, Financing 
So there's a there's a link there that you can have a look at for some microfinancing for loans with the low interest and no interest rates. It does sound good and it can sound complicated as well. Debt Snowball has been great. Um, it's taken, yeah, taken two years off your repayments using this system, which is fantastic. It may have changed its name over time. You might know the Debt Snowball by a different, um, by a different name, but it's the same strategy that can be used as well. There is an opposite strategy, which is called the debt avalanche. So the idea with the debt avalanche is that you pay off the highest interest first. And I'm, I'm going to let Kate explain that one a little bit more. A debt avalanche is where you take out the debt that's costing you the most first. You start with the high interest debt, like credit cards or a car loan. And as soon as that's taken care of, move on to the next highest interest rate. Rinse and repeat. Financially speaking, the avalanche is a quicker way out of debt since we can save more on interest. It's the most efficient way to repay. I can just imagine these two standing opposite each other as they were doing these videos and them saying that my way is the best way. The way that Kate says it is the most mathematically best way to repay debt. Um, and I think that's quite funny. Uh, Kate's awesome. Um, I said somebody went to high school with Kate, so there you go. Both of these strategies can be very, very useful, and mathematically, they can give quite similar results. However, the avalanche can take a little longer for you to see the effect because you are often starting with tackling your highest interest and which is quite often the biggest debt that you're trying to pay off. Paying that off can take a little longer, but once that's gone, all that repayment then goes on to the next biggest debt which combined with the minimum repayment that you were already paying, and now the, the amount that you've taken from the one you just finished, makes that snowball even bigger, and then you move on to the next. But it's not a snowball because it's really sliding down the hill really, really quickly to pay them all off. Either strategy can work. It depends on what how you are wired, what, what motivates you. If you would rather see your debts being ticked off quicker, and instead of having five that you're trying to pay off, you've now got three, then the debt snowball can be really helpful because you can get that motivation and you can be encouraged that you're paying things off. And like Paul said, maybe some of those smaller debts are actually to friends or family and it would be nice to have those paid off for, um, and you, know, you don't have to think about it when you catch up with them. It's gone, it's done, it's paid for. So the debt snowball can be really helpful in helping you do that. Um, but as I said, it all depends on your motivation. But the real key to making this work is that you keep paying the minimum amount on every other debt, except for the one that you're focusing on where you pay more towards that. So it's trying to find more that can be real key. If you are able to work with a financial mentor, then they can help you come up with a strategy and also talk to your creditors with you or even for you if that's what's needed. And they may be able to negotiate a pause on some of those other debts in the meantime because you can show them the spreadsheet you can show them what your plan is and your strategy and when they will eventually be paid off which will no doubt be quicker than what they thought it was going to be so getting the different creditors on board can be really beneficial to making sure that both the debt avalanche or the debt snowball can work for you there is a great tool that you can use. Unfortunately, it's not on Sorted, um, but if you Google Debt Avalanche or Debt Snowball, you will find different tools out there. Probably my favorite one is an Excel-based program, and it's um, just called Vertex 42, and it can it allows you to choose between the different, um, different uh, strategies there as well. So you can compare directly the Snowball with the Avalanche, but there are probably other ones out there as well that you can just try it and see how that works for you and work out when you can pay your debt off. I had a client who had a lot of debts that she was trying to pay off and quite a large um, monetary amount there as well. And she had no real strategy. Her strategy was literally to pay the creditor who was the noisiest one that week. So the one who rang her the most or texted her the most, and she just wanted to get them off her back. So she would pay them that week. And next week it would be whoever else rang her the most and her debt was going to pay her more than 10 years to clear. In fact, I stopped using my spreadsheet because it was going beyond 10 years and it was looking a little hopeless and she was feeling hopeless as well. So we decided to use a debt snowball strategy and talk to her creditors so that we had that plan in place and she was going to be debt free in three years. 
down from 10 plus years down to three years just by having a strategy. And what was more exciting for her than actually getting debt free was knowing that she was then going to be able to start saving. For the first time in a long time, she was able to start thinking about what she could use her money for instead of paying things off. And she wanted a new kitchen. So that was the one thing for her um, that she was really excited to be able to do that. So talking with a financial mentor can be really helpful in helping you to um, initiate one of these strategies. If you have a financial advisor, then they also might have the skills to be able to help you with debt um, strategies as well. So the Sorted uh, website has a debt calculator. Let's have a look and see if we can load this one up for us. Don't like having to click buttons like that, but that's fine. So we've got the Sorted website here and we have the debt calculator. So you can find that up under tools and you'll be able to see all the different tools that are up there. I love seeing all the different new stickers, it means things have been updated, which means it's fun to go and play. So the debt calculator is the, probably the best one to start with when thinking about your debt and what you're trying to pay off. So it just gives you a few different prompts here. Let's say we're just going to pick one today, but if you had more, you could put in other ones. You also can add in multiple of each of these. How much that you're trying to pay off. Let's put in an amount and let's say an interest rate. So a personal loan, let's say we're looking at about 15 percent there and we would like I'm paid fortnightly so I'm going to make sure my payments are fortnightly as well and let's see what happens with this calculator so we can see how much how long it's going to take for us to pay off that loan in fortnights and how much it's going to cost as well so let's have a little look down here yeah, so with the current repayments, you'll be paying $2,105 in interest. So you can see, oh, and also talks about money talks here as well. So if you happen to be on this tool and you're thinking, oh, crikey, I'd like to talk to somebody, here's your clue of who to talk to their money talks. And there's the 0800 number and text as well. So that particular loan, you can see how much, how long it would take you to pay that off. If you wanted, you could change how much you pay off each week. Um, and see what that would be. So if we were to pay it off in, say, uh, we want to pay it off in 24 months. Can I change this? Here we go. And play around and get it to where you want it to be. 28 weeks, 27 weeks, 25, there you go, 24 weeks. You can see how much it would cost you for that $20,000 loan. So in 24 weeks, that total loan would cost that amount of dollars. So it's a great tool that you can actually just play around and work out what's right for you. Interest rates, if you're not sure what different interest rates there are, you can go to interest.co.nz and compare the different interest rates that are out there. Hopefully you guys are able to see that calculator. And can I get a thumbs up if you're able to see my shared screen, my slides still? Awesome, thank you. I've just lost the green outline, which makes me worry that it's gone <laughs> from me and maybe for you. So that calculator can be really, really helpful just to have a little play around. So the minimum repayment was the 446 that I was putting in there per fortnight, but you can change that and it was a top up as well. Yeah, so you can just play around with that calculator to see what works for you and what's not. It was working a bit slow on my side today, so wasn't able to show you quite as well as I would like to, but I'm confident that you can have a look at that yourself and just work out, see what the cost is. But a $20,000 loan of 15% interest over 24 months would end up costing you $23,207 in total. And that's with a fortnightly repayment of $446 per fortnight. Just to give you some sort of baseline ideas there. Remember those numbers, we might talk about them a little bit. Um, later as well. So what happens if we miss a payment? A few people were talking about this earlier in the chat as well. So when we're thinking about loans, we're also thinking about what happens if we miss a payment. So what are some of the things that could happen if we miss a payment, whether it's on our credit card or maybe it's on our mortgage or maybe it's our car loan? Straight on in there, people are there with their fees. So late fees can get charged. So you might get charged a late fee, and then you also might get charged default interest as well. So that's extra interest on top of what you're already paying. 
your credit credit score might take a hit as well. So if you're more than 30 days late, then your credit um, rating starts getting hit with these sorts of things. Until then, you've actually got some space to correct your credit rating before it gets hit. So more than 30 days and it starts to get hit. Huge interest rates can get um, can get charged, but also phone calls as well. Like I mentioned with my client, lots of phone calls, text messages, 11, 12 o'clock at night. It was ridiculous. Many, many phone calls. They say that if you're feeling missed or unimportant, maybe miss a payment on your loan and suddenly you'll be popular again. I'm kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> but certainly if you want to feel, uh, you'll, you'll know if you've missed a payment because they will they will give you a ring and they will text until they hear from you. But there are other things that can happen. Uh, there are things that can happen if we miss our payment. So you may be charged extra fees or interest. You could get charged with that higher interest rate. So that's the default interest, interest rate that you're looking for in your terms and conditions. If you've really missed payments for a, for a long period of time, then they might want to repossess your items or take them back from you, and particularly if they've been provided as security. So what can be repossessed? So not everything can be repossessed. Somebody can't just turn up here to your house and take your TV. If you have secured your, if you've taken out a loan for a TV, then the only thing they can take is that TV, not another TV that might be better or whatever it might be. So it's what is secured for that loan. So you can't just have written on a loan anymore, shattles, which was the word that meant everything in sundry in your house. So it will be specifically written down in your loan what can be repossessed in the case of you not making a payment. So make sure you're aware of what's written down there and that's what it, that's all they can take. They can't take your beds or your bedding. They can't take your whiteware, your medical gear, your heaters, ID, travel documents, bank cards, unless some of those things were bought on higher purchase or on a loan. So if you bought the bed, with that loan, they could take the bed, but they can't take the other bed in the spare room as well. So just keeping it within limits there. There are um, costs if a repossession team breach their responsibilities, and it can be really expensive, up to about $200,000 for an individual and $600,000 for a company who breaches their responsibilities as a repossession company. So that's really, um, it, there is, they have the responsibility to treat you ethically, and fairly and follow the rules otherwise big costs to them and to the company as well. If you have a guarantor then they may get asked to pay um, your loan on your behalf so if you've ever gone guarantor for somebody there is that risk that you will be called to, uh, to pay that loan so being aware that that can happen so please don't ask your grandparents to be a guarantor because you'll be putting them in a strong uh, in a position where they may have to pay for you and unfortunately I have seen that happen as well. Um, it, what happens to your debt when you pass away? It depends on the debt. So it just depends on what it is. If it's tied to a house, it'll, be, it'll stay there. Student loan, um, that one gets wiped when you're passing as well. But otherwise, it becomes part of your estate and dealt with out of your will for your executors to, to deal with there. And what else can happen with if you miss your payment? Uh, the lender could take you to court. Um, they could force... Um, you to make payments they could also potentially threaten things like bankruptcy and also your credit history can be affected as well with your credit score if you've never checked your credit score before it's really worthwhile having a look online um, and requesting your credit um, history it is free to check that as well so you can request that for yourself and that way you know what it is don't do it too often because too many checks on your credit history will affect your credit score it's one of those really weird things that happens but it's good to check to see who else has been checking your credit history as well. I remember being really surprised seeing Sky TV had checked my credit history and I hadn't been a customer of theirs for decades. So that was really bizarre. It was worth, worth following it up as well. So do, getting a credit check on yourself can be really helpful, just getting that report and seeing what's available. So have a look on Sorted, um, Google credit, um, credit score, credit rating, and you'll find out the list of places that you can go to to uh, request that for free. The lenders have responsibilities as well, and I alluded to that when I talked about repossession. They have to stick with the rules. They have to treat you um, carefully and responsibly with respect as well. So they are not allowed to treat you like dirt they have to treat you with respect they need to follow the responsible lending code and also the credit contract and consumer finance act so there are rules for them to follow and obligations to act responsibly 
treat you with respect and ethically as well. So if you're not sure if you can meet your commitments, if you're not sure you're going to make a payment, get in touch with your lender as soon as you can. Before you miss a payment is ideal, but even if you've missed a payment, don't like shove it to one side. Still give them a ring because they still can help you. There are things that they can do. One of the things they can do, and you may have heard it through um, the, the COVID timeframe where we were talking about a lot about ways that we can um, have assistance from lenders specifically around mortgages as well. But a financial a hardship application is the way to go about it. And when you apply for a hardship application, there are options for you. You might be offered a payment holiday or repayment holiday. So maybe two or three months off just to give you a bit of a break so that you can catch up with things. They might, um, that might be just an interest only holiday as well. So maybe you keep paying the interest, but not the principal on, on whatever that loan might be. They might change the terms, so the time frame that your loan is for. They might increase it, so instead of being 20 months, go to 24 months or whatever it might be, just so that that minimum payment or that weekly payment is now smaller. Or it might be a combination of both. They might give you a, a payment holiday, increase your term and give you a period of interest free only, so or interest only, sorry. So there can be a combination of that as well under the hardship, hardship applications. And under the Credit Contract and Consumer Finance Act, your lenders need to help you with this and to consider your application. So if you're talking to somebody and they say, no, we will not consider your application, I would suggest you go over their head. Don't just talk to the person on the phone. Actually go to the hardship application team and talk to them because that's the, that's the place where it needs to sit. Just a quick one as well, lay by and after pay. So that's the lay B U Y, lay by and after pay are not currently covered by the Credit Contract and Consumer Finance Act because there are no extra fees. The uh, ministers involved are trying to change this and have them included under that same code because they should be, um, but we'll see in the meantime. So you don't have the same protection under the Credit Contract and Consumer Finance Act with lay by and after pay as you do with any other sorts of loans there. Any other questions around um, lenders' um, obligations or meeting your own commitments? Hop into the chat if you've got anything there and I will do my best to help you out. But let's have a look at some options that people often consider, which is putting your debt or putting your loan onto your mortgage. We often consider, if you've got a mortgage, people will often say, well, it's your lowest interest option, so why not put your loan onto there? So let's say you've got a holiday that you're trying to, uh, that you want to go away for. So $20,000 going on a holiday, it's well deserved. You really deserve it. And you decide to put it onto your mortgage. 6% over 20 years is what you've currently got. What would be the true cost of that holiday? So $20,000, how much would that end up costing, do you think? A, B, or C, hop into the chat and just let me know. What do we think? Yeah, you guys are jumping straight to the highest amount, and you would be right. So it is, say, $34,000 would be the true cost of that holiday. Well, what about a car? What if we put $80,000 onto our mortgage? Again, 6% over 20 years. To purchase this car, what would be the true cost? The $80,000, how much would that end up being? A, B, or C? Yeah, you're right. It's $138,000, so it is C. Even though a mortgage is the cheapest form of debt, it ends up costing more because it is spread out over a longer period of time. It is insane. I see the comment there in, in the chat. Yeah, because of the longer period of time that we've got going on there, it might be a lower interest rate, but spreading it out over 20 years means it costs an awful lot more. If you want to have a look at that one, we can um, look at the mortgage cut. Oh, sorry about that. Mortgage calculator. Here we go. It is compound interest and it's um, it can work for you and it can work against you. In savings, we look at compound interest and we look at how we can use it for our benefit. But unfortunately, when it comes to debt, 6% um, compound interest every year is a lot. Yeah, you can separate out the amount and pay it off in smaller amounts. If you've got, if you're able to make it into a smaller time frame, then that can work as well. But it's a being aware that if you're just putting it onto your mortgage over 20 years, then you're paying that $20,000 or that $80,000 over 20 years. And it can be a lot, um, a lot bigger than you expect it to be. Let's have a look at $20,000. 
on a mortgage calculator here. So you can have a look at what the different interest rates are. We've got 30 years here. Let's change that to 20. And we can change the interest rate here as well. So let's say we were saying 6%, weren't we? As you can see, interest rates are a little bit higher at the moment. So you can browse interest rates up here. 6% um, is still pretty high. He's hoping it comes down over time as well. So let's see, we've got 20 years. Uh, what else have we got here that we can play with? You can see the total amount. Let's not go monthly. We were doing fortnightly. So let's compare apples with apples. It was 446, I think was the other one before, wasn't it? And now we're at 67 a fortnight. So $34,000 is how much we would pay on interest, uh, pay for that $20,000 loan if we put it onto the mortgage. It's quite interesting to be able to see that there. You can obviously change your repayments. If you decide to um, up that, you'll see what the effect is here as well. You can use the sliding tool if you like. You can also see the effect of changing the interest rate as well and see that bounce around. So interest rate will have a big effect. Also, so will the term will be the biggest change there. Yeah, so you can really have a play around just to see where what things look like for you in terms of your mortgage and what that loan would look like. So it's a great calculator to have a play around with and just to get a real good understanding of what debt look what that debt looks like for you and whether or not putting it onto your mortgage is actually the wise option. As some people have mentioned, you could potentially separate it out. We we do split our mortgage into fixed and variable. So it's the way that we can uh, manage our repayments and also our savings and all that sort of jazz. Um, it's about having that strategy that works for you. You might want to prioritise paying off your debt over purchasing more once and it can save you more um, in the long run as well. So any of those spare coins that you were talking about earlier, putting those towards the debt can pay it off so much quicker. So how do you get that Maria flying high there debt free feeling? Make sure you consider all your options. If you can pay off your debt interest free, then do it and then cut up the credit card. Get rid of it. If the loan is on another type of um, credit, then say your farewells. Unsubscribe from those emails if they keep tempting you with different offers. Get them off your email, get them off your radar so that you're not worried about it or thinking about it without putting it top of mind. If you do have a credit limit, uh, whether it's a credit card or a store card, consider reducing your credit limit to what you can afford to pay off at the end of each pay period. So if you're paid fortnightly, how much could you afford to pay fortnightly to clear that card or if you're paid monthly? Thinking back to that mortgage versus personal loan scenario, if we use the, um, the $20,000, 15% over 24 months, then we were looking at a total cost of $23,200. Putting it on the mortgage, 6% over 20 years was going to be $34,400. So it costs a lot more if we put it on the mortgage, even though the interest rate is lower, it's because of time. But what if we could afford slightly higher fortnightly repayments and we could put it off on the mortgage? So if we use the, um, the $446 per fortnight that the debt calculator um, gave us out as our fortnightly repayments and paid that at 6% on the mortgage, then it could, only could end up taking us two years to pay off and a total cost of $21,000, $100. So maybe your answer is somewhere in between, but being aware of what the difference is and what the options are can be really, really key to making your debt strategy work for you. So what is your goal? What are you trying to achieve for, with your debts? Maybe jot down some of the, the ideas that you've had today. Maybe that you're thinking, I could try the debt snowball. Maybe the debt avalanche. Maybe I need to talk to my lender. Maybe I need to reduce my credit card whatever that might be. Maybe you've got a little bit extra that you could be paying off extra onto your the smallest debt and see what happens. Just to reiterate, as I said earlier, as much as we might want a quick fix, the reality is quite often it's taken us years to get into debt and it's going to take us years to get out of it. Commitment. Though with some good strategies, we can definitely buy back some time. If you're looking for some help, as I mentioned before, you've got Money Talks who can help you. Money Talks is part of the FinCap group. 
um, financial capability and they can help you discuss anything in terms of budgeting advice. So not financial advice, but general budgeting advice, particularly really good around um, budgeting spreadsheets, um, spending plans and debt consolidation and negotiating with creditors for you as well. So if you need somebody to sit along, alongside you, maybe even write a script for you, then they can be very, very helpful. If you've already got a financial advisor, then they can also probably help you with your debt side of things as well. Just check what, they are, um, what their abilities are, if there's actually a, an area they can work in. Obviously, I'm working in that area and debt strategies is, is something I like to help people with, but not every financial advisor is like that. I just have the experience of working as a financial mentor in my past. Also, if you've got a, if you're a part of an, a workplace, then you might have an employee assistance program that you're that you're part of. So, alongside counselling, you can often access financial mentoring as well. So, the budget advice, a uh, budget, um, the budget advice side of things. Sorry, I was getting confused with my different um, available things that are available there. So, that's free for you with a small cost to your employer as well. But there are people who can help you, and that's really key. You don't have to try and work it out on your own. Definitely give it a go. And then if you run into any help, there are people who can help. When it comes to debt, knowing what you're dealing with is key. Don't put off calculating that total cost. I've shown you a couple of really good calculators that you can use, the debt calculator and the mortgage calculator. I also talked about um, Googling some Excel spreadsheets that you can use in terms of your debt snowball and your debt avalanche as well. Once you know what you're dealing with, you can make a plan to pay it down and pay it down as soon as you can. Then you can have that debt-free feeling that we were showing earlier with Maria. So it is a possibility. And if you need help, you don't have to do it alone. There are people who can help you. So what is one thing you're going to do as a result of today's webinar? Pop into the chat and just let me know. And I'm just going to have a quick look at what questions are coming through in the chat there as well, because now's a good time to ask those. Let's have a look. Yeah, you can separate your amounts, definitely. Um, your loans, exactly. So we've, we've split ours into fixed and floating, as I mentioned earlier. Do banks waive charges? Um, if you pay on time, not often, but sometimes, you know what, it's always worth asking. If you've got multiple savings account with a um, with a, a lender, a credit, with a bank, then you can always ask to have some fees waived. Why not? If you don't ask, the answer will definitely be no. Do, doing some research would be great. Finding a financial mentor, fantastic. Using the sort of calculators, sitting with hubby and discussing these things, checking your credit history, some really good ideas that people are going to do. Um, top up your fortnightly mortgage payment. Yeah, also don't forget to get that emergency fund going for yourself as well. Very cool. All right, feel free to keep popping through your questions and any other thoughts that you've got there. But thank you so much for joining us today. I realize you probably need to go back to work. I also need to go back to work. I know some of my colleagues are here. So kia ora. So tēnē te mihi atu kia koutou, māori ora kia tātou. I hope to see you again next week where we look at saving. We'll be sharing some tips, tricks, and compound interest ideas. So I look forward to seeing you there and enjoy the rest of your money month. Kia ora.